Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final Environmental Insurance Power Panel of 2025. Our panelists are going to take a look at climate adaptation, brownfield redevelopments, some recent high-profile incidents, and more. Uh, so let's meet them again. We have Sean Alavi, who is Senior Vice President, National Practice Leader, Environmental at Gallagher, and Aaron Weinstock. He is National Practice Leader, Environmental at BFL Canada. Uh, so welcome to you both. And as Canadian provinces introduce stricter climate adaptation and resilience standards for new developments, my opening question is, how are environmental insurers and brokers responding in terms of coverage for green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, or climate adaptive uh, construction? So are new products or endorsements emerging to address these risks, I guess is, is what I'm asking. Uh, Sean, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, in terms of appetite and approach, not much has changed from the insurer standpoint. There's obviously a greater level of interest in terms of understanding the new technologies, the new uh, natural based solutions and the engineering behind that. Uh, for example, if you think about um, if you think about thermal energy and, you know, conducting energy or heat from the ground, you know, those kinds of things are being looked at in terms of the exposures that's beneath the surface a little bit more stringently. Um, the other thing to kind of note is that a lot of these environmental policies also already have a form of green energy or green remediation language built into the products. Um, you know, in the event that the insured suffers a loss, they have the ability to kind of restore their site with more environmentally friendly materials. Um, and I just don't think that a lot of um, insurers are taking advantage of that coverage or building it into their contingency plans. Okay, interesting. So some of these products have, are already almost ready to go, if you want, Aaron. Some of them perhaps uh, need to be developed a little bit. Do you think there, there should be more availability in general? You know what, Paul, I would say that supporting these projects is nothing new for environmental insurers. They've been underwriting and covering these types of risks for tra traditional pollution exposures for a long, long time now. Where the expansion has really come is in the availability of carbon capture and carbon credit insurance. There are a handful of these products available now, including things like uh, carbon tax credit liability, that sort of thing. So to that end, we're seeing interest on the M&A side of the house when companies are acquiring uh, renewable energy facilities, uh, in particular for tax liabilities. So that's really where we're seeing, again, some, some more inquiries for sure at this point. Well, let's pick up on that a little bit. So the federal government is, of course, making a push for net zero emissions and increased enforcement of, of carbon reporting. So, Aaron, are you seeing new demand for environmental insurance linked to carbon capture, storage, trading products? And indeed, how is the market handling these unique liability exposures of, of these emerging technologies? For sure. Yes. So where we're seeing new demand is, again, applying traditional insurance policies to construction projects and transaction risk involving types of facilities rather than like a brand new insurance product. So if you look at a, something like a dam or energy from waste facility, landfill gas plant, something like that. There are challenges for those that go well beyond net zero or anything of that nature, just more in the traditional pollution sense. So, you know, to the extent modern and renewable facilities are being put onto brownfield sites or other sites with industrial history, that sort of thing, the classic exposures are what crops up as being more of a hindrance than any sort of new technology. And Sean, how are clients reacting to this? Give us, give us their point of view. Yeah, I think generally speaking, Paul, when these projects do have the green light to kind of move forward, there is an interest in obviously securing this coverage because there's an element of the unknown. These projects are a huge capital expense for a lot of our clients. So, you know, a lot of the times this process is obviously assessing the market feasibility, exploring the coverage, but it takes a lot to actually execute coverage in this space. Um, the other thing that's really a, a hindrance point for a lot of our clients that are looking to explore this is the contract certainty piece around like the customers and government funding because they want to have that stability if they're putting that up, that much capital up um, to execute these projects. So kind of going back to Aaron's point, they're not really markets are not really shying away around this type of risk. It's more about managing limits, uh, permit, potentially lowering the terms and and really understanding you know, the life cycle of the process, right? So, um, you know, the, from the projects we've kind of seen or explored, a lot of it comes in remote areas where innately risk is a lot lower. So it's a lot easier to digest from a market standpoint. 
And one area, Sean, as well, where we've definitely seen an, an uptick is uh, in brownfield redevelopment and urban infill projects across Canada, of course. So just tell us a little bit about the, the latest trends in underwriting and pricing for pollution legal lab liability and, and remediation cost cap policies uh, related to these developments. And indeed, are there any new requirements around site investigation, monitoring or ongoing compliance? Yeah, thanks, Paul. And I think generally speaking from like a contractor's pollution liability, we've kind of talked about this over the last few quarters that market conditions are super soft. There's a lot of capacity in the space. The uniqueness around at least the, the premise pollution and the site pollution programs is a lot of it has to do with the insurer's profitability and what they've been exposed to in terms of losses uh, during their time um, within the Canadian marketplace. But I will say that obviously on Harrier types of risks, there are some like coverage drawbacks or there is some um, hesitancy to provide full capacity um, and especially on these construction projects that you mentioned well we're, when we're looking at you know redeveloping a site a site that's considered a brownfield there's going to be costs that are not going to be able to be insured um, from a market standpoint so yes there are cost cap there is remediation overrun coverage but the markets that are offering that are being very meticulous around the information that's available. They want to understand what the consultant's estimates are for that remediation. They want to understand the market conditions. They want to understand, you know, what um, medians have been impacted. Um, and generally speaking, the capacity that they're willing to offer is significantly lower than a site that would not be considered a brownfield. So there is a huge risk in undertaking coming from those markets um, that, you know, needs to be explored. There needs to be good information. And the last bullet I'll kind of leave you with is we've also noticed a lot of construction companies relying on site pollution products to cover the operational and construction phase of a project. The, the, the challenge with that is that a lot of those forms are not written to cover construction related activities. So I would challenge most brokers that place environmental for these types of projects to revisit their material change and use endorsements because there could be a scenario where a claim is not picked up if they're using it as a as a backstop for construction projects. So from Sean's description there, Aaron, it sounds like it's quite a cautious market. Would you agree? Yes, I would certainly agree that it's a cautious market out there. Uh, you know, for, for development risk, in, in a sense, cleaning up your site that you own for on-site pollution is almost a business risk. You know, you've purchase a site, you're developing a site, there's contamination there, it's a choice that you've made. Where coverage is very common, as Sean suggested, is on a contractor's pollution side because you can get coverage for exacerbating known contamination, which is a little more of a, I guess, fortuitous loss from the insurer's perspective. Now, with that said, in some cases, with really good environmental due diligence, insurers will, on a premises pollution side, carve up the site and pick and choose which contamination contaminants they would like to exclude and allow discovery of unknown contamination on your site, but it gets really convoluted. You can have exclusions that are in soil only or in groundwater only or in this area only, that, that sort of thing. And that makes, from my perspective, the policy response difficult to predict and uh, honestly to explain to the client how, how it's going to work. So it can be a bit complicated there. Uh, but if a client can accept that they are going to be responsible for remediating cleanup or remediating the contamination at their own site and consider that as a business risk, there is certainly uh, some flexibility for Offsite liability in case a neighbor or municipality or a regulator gets themselves involved. Of course, we should talk as well, Aaron, about the sort of recent spate of high profile environmental incidents that have been, such as pipeline spills and industrial fires. Tell us a little bit about how insurers and, and brokers are collaborating with clients on the back of this in terms of crisis management, emergency response planning, reputational risk mitigation as they, as they look to form environmental liability programs. Yeah, I would, I would say that all these resources you're mentioning, they're they're in the market and they're underutilized. For for years now, environmental insurers have provided crisis management costs, emergency response costs, and engineering resources, including spill response hotlines, as part of their uh, value add coverages here. And you know, the, the clients in many cases are not aware that these coverages exist or these enhancements exist, and it's our job as brokers to let them know this is out there. Uh, other insurers or some insurers are really focused on prevention and how resources available to support insurance for things like mold management or asbestos management, or even will provide some spill response um, advice. But the uptake for that is is quite poor, I would say, overall. You know, we have in-house engineers at brokers and, and 
at the brokerages and we have um, insurer engineers who are available to us. It's just a matter of, again, being open and drawing upon those resources as available to us. Okay, so to summarize Aaron's points there, Sean, it sounds like the policies are ahead of the game, but clients not necessarily aware that these coverages exist. Would you agree? Yeah, 100%. I think there's definitely a uh, underutilization around what uh, Aaron had kind of already mentioned. A lot of those coverages are already baked into the policy. I think the other thing is also understanding what resources your insurer and your broker have to help you kind of mitigate risk and improve your risk profile. Um, because there are resources at any of the bigger shops that kind of help you do that. Um, the other thing is, I think there's also still a heavy reliance on on an insurer's environmental consultant um, to help put these plans and procedures in place. Um, whether they're actually being executed, that kind of falls onto the the operational side of the business and making sure that they are doing what is being developed, uh, uh, what is being developed for them. So. Um, you know, there is, you know, there's two sides to that story. And I think, you know, both sides need to be utilized a lot more efficiently. I think as it's our final uh, gathering of 2025, it's only fitting that we wrap up with a little tech talk. It does seem to have been the, the theme of the year. So as technology advances, Sean, are, are you leveraging remote sensing, AI-driven environmental monitoring or, or blockchain indeed for, for claims validation and risk assessment? And, and what impact are you seeing these innovations have on underwriting accuracy, claims timelines, claim engagement indeed in the environmental space across Canada? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Paul. Like I think the, the challenge is a lot of these things require a heavy amount of capital investment. So I know like from our experiences here at Gallagher, there is a lot of um, capital going into developing more um, technologically advanced uh, applications or even engagement of AI in our day-to-day -day use. Um, the one thing that obviously is a benefit is going to be that the time saving from either an underwriting standpoint, like a negotiation standpoint, or even from a claims handling standpoint. Um, obviously, with saving a time, you get more efficiencies. Uh, you need you need less manpower. Um, but I think on the on the other side of the coin, like you have to start thinking about the the long term plan in terms of what you're hoping to accomplish for the client, right? So. Um, I've seen examples around even, you know, claims executions around like using satellite imagery to kind of assess the damage of a claim. Um, and we're seeing a lot more and more um, niche products come out even from like a parametric standpoint, right? Where, you know, you're, you're identifying um, a trigger based on a certain scenario or a certain type of event that happens. So, um, you know, all in all, it's helping us create better efficiencies across the marketplace, making better decisions and um, helping educate our clients uh, in a way where they've never thought of it before. Okay, quite a positive outlook on the technological revolution then. Aaron, do you, uh, are you in agreement with Sean on this? Yeah, I would agree that AI makes or has the capability of making life simpler for clients, for insurers, for, for ourselves as brokers. And, you know, like uh, Sean mentioned, we at BFL2 are investing heavily in AI and have looking for the, are looking for the best ways to deploy this across our business. With respect to environmental insurance in particular, it's been a problem for years. Uh, data has been. There's so many reports, so many sites, and just being able to keep that in order is, is, is challenging. And so AI is very great, very good for um, processing and summarizing large volumes of this data for everyone's advantage here. You know, never will replace, in my perspective, reading, underwriting, engineering conversations. Like it's 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 a tool to help us be more efficient at it. And you know, as a really almost too obvious example here, it's very makes makes more risk more accessible to more people. So, with the right tools, you know, underwriters who could not handle French reports, for example, could can now run it through AI, get a good summary of what the information is, and the old method of either declining a risk or running every paragraph through Google Translate that that's gone. So certainly. It's uh, it's going to help uh, you know with the market help more markets get involved and just help uh, better risk outcomes for everyone. Well, fantastic thoughts. And indeed, huge thanks to all of our panelists for their contributions throughout 2025, including Amanda, Shane and Justin, who couldn't make it today. Uh, we'll have some more exciting developments in the environmental insurance space in 2026, of course. But until then, keep it right here on Insurance Business TV.